Welcome everyone to the Friday edition of the Damage Board with me, John Arula, and joining us almost at the last minute and being very nice and being able to do so, Ben Glebe is back on the show. Ben, how's it going? Very good. How are you, John? I'm I'm feeling good. It's a Friday. I'm looking forward to our show. I know that I've got Jenk and Ida Rodriguez on the Young Turks later on, and nice. then it's the weekend. I'm gonna be spending the weekend playing a bunch of board games like an absolute dork. So I'm I'm feeling good. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm gonna spend the weekend doing a bunch of shows like an absolute workaholic and not relaxing <laughs> playing games like a dork, which I wish I was. <laughs> um, yeah, where I'm are these shows? Around. Uh, I'm performing tonight at the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach, and tomorrow night at Don't Tell Comedy. And then I'm doing a virtual show worldwide on the 29th in a couple weekends. My my third annual Halloween special. It's a Glebe off the top uh, Halloween spectacular. <laughs> I hope I didn't scare you with that boo there. Uh, or you can get tickets to that from anywhere in the world and join me live from your computer at bengleeb.com. And my special awesome. uh, is still out if you like stand-up comedy that is pre-recorded, but way better than the risks of a live show. The Mad King is available right now on YouTube. Even dogs love it. <gasps> Wait, who's this dog? This is Henry Horse, the greatest dog in the world. He, he's a news dog and he's got opinions on all the news. What do you think about the Jan 6 committee hearings? Yeah, <laughs> he looks away. He's not into it. He's focused on inflation and reproductive rights. I don't think he cares too much about that. That's right. Anyway, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, everyone, there are some dates coming up. If you're in the area, go see it live. But if you can't see him live, you got no excuse. There's awesome pre recorded stuff available worldwide. As long as you're in a country that's allowing you to access the internet, I suppose, which is most of them. Yeah. Anyway, um, hard, we have a to lot. Get my special in e- e- Iran today, unfortunately. So it is unfortunately that's one of the biggest struggles facing them as of right now. Um, so we have a lot that we're going to be talking about, uh, and we'll get into that in just a sec. Uh, someone in the chat did just let me know, and I see people talking about it on Twitch. Ah, this sucks. Robbie Coltrane passed. He was 72 years old. Uh, most notably, I think for a lot of American viewers, he played Rubius Hagrid in the Harry Potter movies, but he was also in Goldeneye and you know, a million other things and everything. That's sad. We were 72, that's not enough, Ben. I think we can agree on that. We were talking before the show about how old we'd be comfortable living to, like as a minimum, and 72 is not enough, I don't think. Yeah, I said 90 as a minimum. You said 78. I'm I'm stunned by how low that number was. Well, it might be that you anticipate living to 90. I don't anticipate living to 78, so it's quite aspirational. Oh, wow. I anticipate living to 104. So <laughs> that's wild. You don't anticipate Good you must luck. Be playing some pretty hardcore board games over there. <laughs> they are, okay? When when you play these games, you win or you die. Or something. Anyway, um, we have a lot of non uh, sad Rubius Haggard related news that we're going to be talking about. So, everyone, I'm going to need you to uh, buckle securely up, hit the like button, share the stream if you want. And you can send us comments and all that, and we'll respond as we go. But with all that said, Ben, you ready to start the show? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. In fact, let's jump directly into this. I am offering this resolution that the committee direct the chairman to issue a subpoena for relevant documents and testimony under oath from Donald John Trump in connection with the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, there are nine ayes and zero noes. The resolution is agreed to. So with that, the resolution was agreed to. They are gonna be subpoenaing Donald Trump to cooperate with and testify before the January 6 committee. Now, will he actually do that? That's a different question. Should he actually do that? That's a far spicier question, I think. And we're gonna dive into all of that. But you should know that we we won't necessarily know for a little bit exactly how this is gonna go. They're drafting the paperwork. Then there's gonna be a period of time where he has to respond. And if he doesn't choose to cooperate, then the actual appeal on that could take literally months. Which isn't just like frustrating, cuz you'd have to wait for it. 
it's way worse than that. If he decides not to do it, and if they drag out the appeals process until December, January, February, uh, that's the same exact thing as dragging it out for 100 years because there's a very real chance that the Democrats won't be in control anymore. The January 6th committee won't exist anymore. And then Trump wouldn't have to do it if he doesn't want to. So with that as the backdrop, what do we know so far about Donald Trump's interest or willingness to actually engage in this? Well, he clearly hates the committee. He's been clear about that for you know months before it even existed. So that's true. Um, but he has been telling aides at least that he would look forward to testifying before the committee. So he could probably spout a bunch of consp- conspiratorial nonsense. But that doesn't mean that he actually will do it. Bragging to aides about how you take on Liz Cheney is different than actually sitting down, being sworn in and risking perjury as you're asked questions about what you did and didn't do, what you said and didn't say. And so while this morning he put out this statement, you can see a shot of the the top of it. He's titled his memo to Benny Thompson peacefully and patriotically. And the first line, what the former president of the United States sent to them is the presidential election of 2020 was rigged and stolen. And it only gets more conspiratorial from there. He literally at one point blames black voters in urban areas for stealing the election from him amongst a lot of other nonsense. And so he does say at the end of it, at your request, I I will present these additional numbers to you saying that he would do it maybe, but theoretically only live. And only so he could say like something that he saw in 2000 mules or something. So Ben, what do you think? Is this gonna happen? Should he actually do it? Well, I admire several things in this statement. One, the fact that he is saying out loud yet again, what the Republican Party has said in their actions for so long. They blame African American voters for voting, (laughs) not for them. (laughs) <laughs> what a crime against this country that is, voting in their own interest and not voting in the interest of people trying to literally take away their vote. How wild. Secondly, you did point out accurately, John, that he does not like this committee or believe in it, but still might testify before it, which tracks for Donald Trump because. He also clearly does not like or respect America. But that doesn't mean he doesn't want to speak in front of it all the time either. <laughs> the man will take any audience, whether hostile or not, whether a place that cares for him or not, as long as he gets a little more airtime. I think I even thought of a solution this morning that might be the perfect ending for Donald Trump is What's put that? him on Celebrity Big Brother. Give him a 24 hour camera, but have that season of Celebrity Big Brother take place from inside a jail. Everybody wins. <laughs> I'd tune in, at least in the first, I'll give any show one episode, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I look, my, my guess would be that after this very carefully constructed set of hearings, uh, I don't think they would want him to testify live because that would be, well, I can't express with the language restrictions we're under what that would be like. But you get the idea, it would be wild, we'll say that. Um, And if they would, what's that? Well, sorry sorry to interrupt, but I just found it to be such a strange move that they did this right at the very end of all Mm -hmm. of all of their hearings. Because it just kind of gives Trump power again at the end to like control the narrative of a thing they've carefully constructed. I mean, literally at the end of their supposedly last live hearing, they're like, but we might do one more where we invite the guy who we're accusing to come and lie to all of you and turn it into a (laughs) circus live on the air. It just seems really strange. Obviously, if he does come, he's going to lie. And it's now brings up whether they can end the whole committee before the midterms like they or before the Congress switches over at least like they intend. And so it just seems a very strange move and I don't know what their exact goal is here. Yeah, my, my assumption would be they'd want it to be behind closed doors so that the craziest of the lies they wouldn't have to actually have broadcast live. But It's an opportunity where we know that Donald Trump, when he sits down, while he's good at communicating, not in terms of making sense or being sane or, you know, not being the worst, 
Um, he's usually good at telling the right what they want to hear. When you are under oath, uh, he's going to commit crimes. He's going to commit perjury. I mean, remember, as I pointed out in our coverage yesterday, sitting down with Chris Matthews, uh, Chris Matthews got him to say, uh, I would punish the woman for having an abortion. And Lester Holt got him to say, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I fired Comey for the Russia thing. Um, and who is the journalist that got him? To admit that he he what he did consider COVID to be super serious, but he needed to say that he doesn't like. When that dude sits down, he just says stuff, and often not under you know penalty of jail time. And so they might be able to wrap this thing up just getting him to admit to stuff live in the committee. Um, also, how are they going to get him to? How are they going to get him to agree and not have it be live? They even said in their statement. This all points to him. The American people deserve to hear directly from him to then yeah. say, but we're going to tape it and only show you the parts we like. Seems antithetical to hearing directly from him. Um, he And you're right, he does say things live, but I don't think he's afraid of saying something wrong and there being any consequences. He's done it his old life. He called BS on the Constitution and he was right. Thus far, he's right because he has not been held to account. I'm surprised yeah. his, his legal team hasn't literally pulled out the, well, also President Trump hasn't used his get out of jail free card yet. And nowhere <laughs> in Monopoly does it say this can't be used as a legal card. That's that's a good point. I'm gonna check the rules this weekend as I'm playing board Doesn't games. But I've, yeah, I've looked. <laughs> there you go. Um, so we'll see. We'll find out. Uh, hopefully, within the next couple of weeks, we'll at least know if it's going to happen. Um, are they trying to sneak this in before the midterms? Whew, that could be risky. We'll have to see. Uh, but that wasn't the only thing that was revealed during the last January 6th committee. Uh, we also had a little bit of spicy footage, and we're not gonna show you a bunch. We did live coverage at the time. But there was one moment that I just, I felt like we had to briefly talk about, and it involved Nancy Pelosi. Take a look. And that's what this is all about. Secret Service said they have dissuaded him from coming to Capitol Hill. They told him they don't have the resources to protect him here. So at the moment, he is not coming, but that could change. 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 I would come to him and punch him out. And so I know I would pay to see I've been that. waiting for this, for trespassing on the Capitol ground. I'm gonna punch him out and I'm gonna to go to jail and I'm gonna be happy. Yes, I think that's the most aggressive I've ever seen Nancy Pelosi. That was of course uh, as the buildings were being stormed, as Nancy Pelosi and a lot of other people in Congress were probably at least somewhat worried about the possibility that they might be ripped limb from limb by an insane fascist mob. And acknowledging that she is being filmed and she knows that, and she does, you know, she thinks about how things look. She loves her little moments and stuff like that. Uh, that said, hearing her talk about punching him in the face is not usually the way we hear Nancy Pelosi talk. Ben, what do you think? Yeah, I loved that she turned to the camera after that and said, uh, "And I will go to jail." Acknowledging, <laughs> I know I'm being filmed and I know it's illegal. If there was no camera here. I wouldn't necessarily admit to the jail part. Um, I wish she seemed more intimidated during it. Like that footage is stark and pretty strange, but also I don't know that it really helps the case. I don't feel like she and Chuck Schumer, Chuck Schumer, Chuck Schumer <laughs> seemed, that's hard to say fast, uh, seemed particularly scared for their lives. They seemed more like they were on the phone trying to, you know, figure out what they can do to stop the thing. Um, and also, I don't know plausibly how it would have worked. They were afraid to go out of their offices, but if Trump showed up, Nancy would have stormed through the Viking and the <laughs> people smearing feces on the walls to get to Trump and knock him in the face. I'd love it, but it seems a little too end of a 90s romantic comedy for me mm -hmm. to have plausibly happened in life. But I would pay to see it. I mean, that's a pay per view post both of them being in public <laughs> office that yeah. would make huge money for charity. Uh, so I, I do want to use this as an opportunity. I understand there are some people, maybe big fans of Nancy Pelosi, they'll be like, yeah. And and I, to some extent, get it. Trump is the worst. We hate what he does, and we particularly hate January 6th. But I will remind you, there's some amazing write-ups of what she actually did following January 6th. So there she's saying, I will go to jail for slugging him in the face. But what did Nancy Pelosi actually do? There were people who, as she's filming that, there are people who are already working on impeachment resolutions. We now know. 
I think Ryan Grimm had a write up on the intercept about the actual timeline there. And they wanted to expedite this and Nancy Pelosi didn't let them. She had them go on their little break for several days. And that may not seem relevant, I mean, after all, at the end of the day, he was actually impeached. But of course, he was not convicted in the Senate. And maybe he was never going to be. But we also know that people like Mitch McConnell and those were coming out in the immediate aftermath of January 6th saying, this was Donald Trump, he has responsibility. And notably, they didn't have an opportunity to vote on convicting him then. It had to wait days and days and days and days. And during that time, the right sort of banded together. And they, while initially they were like, "Oh God, have we crossed some sort of horrible line? Is our base gonna turn against us for literally trying to kill Mike Pence and overturn democracy? It only took a few days for them to realize, no, actually the base is perfectly fine with that. They, the only frustration they have is that it didn't succeed. And so Nancy Pelosi can talk about punching him day of for a video that maybe she planned to put out. Although admittedly, it took until now for it to come out. Um, but behind the scenes, she used her power as speaker to stop immediate consequences from rolling forward. And so I find that very frustrating. Yeah, why? Why would she have done that? It's just again, like uh -huh. you're like you're saying, it just shows political theater. It shows that these people are to some degree kind of in cahoots with each other. They're playing a game. Oh, Trump's playing his game. Let's well, get cameras rolling down below. And but when there's a chance to actually hold them to account, let's not do it immediately when they know exactly how cowardly the Republicans are. And if they have one moment of them being against Trump, if you don't capitalize on it now, of course, in a couple of days, they're gonna be changing their tune. I mean, yeah. McCarthy was already en route to Mar-a-Lago at that point to pose exactly, for a photo. Yeah. Yeah, she look, they they have said or it's come out that their strategy was let's let's slow down on impeachment and let's just cross our fingers and hope that they use the 25th Amendment. Come on. That was their strategy. Trump's it own team. It didn't happen. Trump's own team. The only way they would have invoked the 25th Amendment would have been if the 25th Amendment comes free with every book deal. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe. Maybe that is what they were focusing on at that point. We okay, can't invoke uh, the Twenty Fifth Amendment. There will be no exciting spoilers to to save no no surprise twists. M Night Shyamalan style for our tell all <laughs> books. The country's crumbling, but my God, do I want to keep the real nuggets of how I was sure he was unhinged and dangerous to our country for when my book comes out, so I can tease those nuggets on Bill Maher and on. Uh, Fox News and get get and even all on, on all the liberal media and get them to to yeah. be like wow it's so it is true he was crazy and now you're on our team even though you had an obligation to save us then but we yeah. get book sales we get it yeah there's one other little minor bit of news I just want to make sure that we cover just because it's so ridiculous uh, Donald Trump is of course feeling pressure from a number of different legal challenges uh, one of them is in New York where the AG is pressuring him over a variety of forms of fraud. And we know that she's coming for a lot of money, literally hundreds of millions of dollars, as well as shutting down the Trump organization. Well, Donald Trump has a little plan, okay, a little backup plan, maybe in case that happens. He's got a whole new thing, he's moving on. He doesn't care about the Trump organization. He's got something he likes more. We call it Trump Organization 2. <laughs> he started a new company and then that's what it's called. It was registered on September 21st, the very day that Letitia James filed a 220 page fraud lawsuit against Trump, his family and the original busted old Trump organization. On Thursday, James's office fought back against this move, filing court papers that asked a Manhattan judge to bar him for moving any assets from the Trump Organization to the Trump Organization to so that they'd be protected from the quarter billion dollar judgment that she wants against him. And they're also asking for the the lawyer to appoint an independent monitor to oversee the Trump Organization so that if they do anything tricky with moving money or hiding money or whatever, they can potentially see that. And they want to, it's described as quickly by insider, hold a hearing to set a trial date for early October 2023, as well as serve Trump with a copy of the lawsuit, which currently Eric Trump has refused to accept. Because this is what you do, you can do when you're rich. Like you're facing a quarter billion dollar lawsuit. You just don't have to take it, I guess. Isn't that weird? 
if you committed a, a petty crime, like if a cop comes up to you, you just, I, I don't even hear you. I don't even see you really. Like, no, you're allowed to do that when you're rich. But anyway, uh, yeah, I will remind you, they're aiming for October 2023. This would be like far into the Republican primary at that point. If he chooses to run, you can't move it along faster there. But anyway, Ben, what do you think about Trump Organization 2? They really are rebooting everything these days, aren't they? Yes, they are. Trump Organization 2, this time it's personal. <laughs> uh, you would you would hope that they would have been smart enough instead or not hope, I guess, to instead of doing a sequel, they would have they should have really done a prequel and changed the narrative. <laughs> oh, you go back in time. That's how you can avoid committing the crimes in the first place. But they're not interested in that. They just want to be able to paper it over with Trump Organization 2, which they also started a new offshoot, Trump Organization LLC, just one week before that. And then an offshoot of that was on the 21st, Trump Organization 2. So they have basically two new organizations now. Um, I think that's what the world needs more and more Trump filled organizations. Yeah. Uh, just putting money under each of them like a shell game and switch them around like the Times Square hucksters they actually are now just going full on shell under the cup for all of us to see. <laughs> but surprisingly, they're not okay with someone looking at making sure they don't put funds illegally in that company. Yeah. This is a totally legit company. Wait, you're gonna look? The <laughs> point is, let's can someone start organization three? <laughs> just in case. Uh, yeah, no, the, the lawyers, as Ben is pointing out, uh, they have said that none of this legal stuff is necessary. You don't need this special monitor, you don't need to look into that. Um, and here's why, Lena Haba says, we have repeatedly provided assurance in writing that the Trump organization has no intention of doing anything improper. <laughs> oh, in that case, <laughs> no, but do you see the tricky thing that she's doing there? The Trump organization won't do anything improper. But what about the Trump Organization too? She doesn't say anything about whether it would ever do anything improper. You're not gonna get us that way, Alina Hava. I see what you're doing. <laughs> so that is stupid. amazing, that's a very strong point. That's like saying uh, Donald Trump did not head up an insurrection against the company. Former President Donald Trump did, but that's <laughs> semantics. Uh -huh. uh, it's Jeez. pretty wild, that is pretty wild and a very strong point. Yeah, don't look over here, look over there. They're literally magicians, but they're like a they're like a very cheap magic shop magician who's like, look, can I just get you to buy the the, the string thing that makes your <laughs> card float or not? I gotta be somewhere, kid. I got alimony payment. <laughs> yeah. Wow, you can do some fast world building there. Anyway, <laughs> um, we're gonna take our first break of the hour. But when we come back, uh, Senator Ron Johnson is trying to fend off a challenge from Mandela Barnes in the Wisconsin Senate race. We're gonna give you some of the highlights and lowlights from their debate after this. Okay, everybody, let's jump into some fun with the Wisconsin Senate debates, starting with this. Mr. Barnes, you go first. What do you find admirable about your opponent? Well, no, no, seriously, I do think you know the senator has proven to be a family man, and I think that's, that's admirable. Mr. Johnson. I mean, likewise, I appreciate the fact that uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes had loving parents, a school teacher, father at work third shift, so he had you know good upbringing. I guess what puzzles me about that is with that upbringing, why is he turned against America? I mean, why, why, why does he find the right. founding of America awful? Right. It's, it's, it's Somehow, we, it puzzles we me. did not. I said Please we argue. said something admirable. Acknowledging that. That question is a little bit annoying. They always do it. It's a little bit annoying. We we know that these people disagree with each other and, and despise each other. That said, it is sort of the last remaining minimal bar for a little bit of civility in politics. And Mandela Barnes did a great job. I mean, to be fair, Mandela Barnes gave the answer that everyone does. It's always, well, he seems to like his family, I guess. That's like the <laughs> easiest thing to say. But he said it and he didn't undercut it afterward. Ron Johnson couldn't even pass. That bar that is so low, it's buried in Earth's core. He immediately had to turn on Mandela Barnes. And what I like is that the audience wasn't having it. They were booing him, they were laughing. Nobody seemed to like it, Ben, but what do you think? 
Yeah, Ron Johnson is just an unmitigated piece of garbage. The man is a horrible, racist, misogynist. He's against every bit of human rights that we thought was long settled in this country. He's a hypocrite, he contradicts himself constantly. This is one of his more noble moments, which was taking the one noble moment and turning it into a personal attack. At least that personal attack was direct. At least it doesn't, didn't, probably not gonna have something coming out later. He actually meant a different personal attack. This is one of the most <laughs> straight up things Ron Johnson's done, and I commend him strongly for it. Exactly. Total and utter garbage. Um, but while he was mocked there by the crowd, laughed at, it wasn't the only time that he was laughed at or jeered. He weirdly decided to step in it, as you'll see in this clip. In response to the wild charge of uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, the FBI set me up with a corrupt, with a corrupt briefing, and then leaked that to smear me. I am. No, I mean, right, let's, I'm sorry. Let's I'm sorry. But the Ron Johnson. So what? What is he referring to there? It's going to be very abundantly clear to most right wingers because they're part of that right wing insane cinematic universe or whatever. But what he appears to be referring to, and then declares that they are the corrupt ones. Is that Johnson was informed at an FBI briefing back in 2020 that he was the target of Russian disinformation as part of a campaign to make him useful to the Kremlin? Understand it. It was not the FBI attacking him, implying anything about him. They were saying, oh, by the way, we have reason to believe that they're targeting you. It's like if you were to warn someone that they might be hacked soon, it's a defensive briefing. That's actually what it's called. And he decided when he was told, you are going to be attacked by Russian disinformation. He took a side and it was the side of the disinformation. And he has declared them to be corrupt, saying that if anything was leaked from there, it was designed just to hurt him. All he had to do was say, thank you for the heads up. I'm gonna be careful about you know what I share, what I say and all that. And he couldn't even pass that bar. And again, he got laughed at then. Yeah, this is like in the first Terminator movie when the good dude who ends up impregnating Sarah Connor tries to help her escape from the mental institution and the Terminator's coming at them and he says, follow me down the hallway, get down, get down, duck. And she's like, you telling me to duck is disgusting and it is <laughs> an attempt to besmirch my character. Oh, I've been shot by the Terminator. I mean, it's the most bad <laughs> words. Way to see things yeah. and is par for John John Bronson's tiny little brain. <laughs> yeah, it's like, look out behind you, get off my back, I'm not turning. <laughs> oh, sure, I'm yeah. gonna fall for the classic move of you trying <laughs> to protect me as a law enforcement organization from our adversaries. Yeah, I bet Russia's yeah. right behind me trying to, whoops, <laughs> and now he's in jail, Russian yeah, jail. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see if any of this gets through. I mean, Ron, you you started off by saying that Ron Johnson is a piece of garbage, and that is true. And he's such a piece of garbage that at this point, I'm not sure how much extra utility there is in him demonstrating what a piece of garbage he is. I feel like people get that. Um, and so I, I want to show you the most recent polling, by the way, if we can jump ahead to graphic four. Uh, I've seen polls where Barnes is within the margin of error, down by just a point or whatever, but the aggregate has Johnson up by 2.9 and that is like I get that most people are focusing a lot less on this race than like on Pennsylvania or on Georgia. I get it. We're focusing more on those other races. But Johnson is just so obviously not so obviously bad. So obviously uninterested in any ethical obligations to his constituents or to, you know, be a part of a functioning government. He believes and spreads conspiracy theories like crazy. It should not be that close, Ben. Yeah, it's it's just insane. It it just speaks more again to the political polarization in this country, where for some reason half of the country. Look, I, I realize both sides are certainly polarized, and both sides are not inclined to ever think anything positive about the other side or consider candidates from the other side. But I can't help but point out time and again that. That needs to change when one person is just so clear, one side is so clearly anti American at the moment, when one side is just so clearly in it for their own selves and for lining their own pockets at the cost of everything yeah. decent and good. It shouldn't be just back in mid September that they were even in the polls. It should be a runaway 
with yep. goodness. I mean, there are so many people that have left the Republican Party saying this election needs to be blue all the way, regardless of what you believe on any individual issue, to send a message that there will be actual law and order, actual democracy, actual following of our norms. And instead, they'll just take the outlier self interested examples and say, well, Tulsi Gabbard left the Democrats. Okay, because she's been a Russian <laughs> asset and a Republican in her soul for already years now, even when she was running for the Democratic nomination, basically. So uh, let's hope people come to their senses in the privacy of the voting booth and not we'll for their family during a dinner poll. I mean, look, the, the Democrats put up bad candidates every cycle. That is true. And 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 the, some of the worst ways that they're bad candidates is that they can be very blatantly corrupt. I mean, there's any number of Democratic candidates that are very, very corrupt. But in terms of just like like being like viciously opposed to government existing, believing and spreading whatever conspiracy theory 4chan comes up with. There is not, as far as I know, a single Democrat that's anywhere like that that even is on the scale. And there's hundreds of Republicans at every level. Like they're just there isn't an equivalent. It's just the big difference is that no one says both sides are not corrupt. They are, but we need to remind everybody that. In a corrupt system that needs to be fixed, there is still one side that publicly fights for things that help you, one side that also publicly fights for things that hurt you while being yeah. corrupt. Which exactly. would you rather have? It's not a great choice, but it still is a clear choice. Uh, I want to jump into just a little bit more. They they did get into the substance. I mean, a lot of it was was fairly comical with Ron Johnson. But let's jump directly into this uh, third video. Minimum wage has not gone up since 2009. In Wisconsin, our minimum wage is still the federal minimum wage of seven dollars twenty five cents. It is shameful. Since 2014, we've been supporting a fifteen dollar minimum wage. And for the most one of the most wealthy members of Congress to sit and say that Congress shouldn't set a standard of living. And raising the minimum wage is the frustration that so many people have in this country. It's why people are tuned out of, of politics, because they feel like nobody's looking out for them. And that's because Ron Johnson is in the United States Senate, not looking out for us. So it is one thing for Democrat Mandel Barnes to uh, you know, point out that Ron Johnson is rich and disconnected, doesn't understand regular people's lives, isn't interested in learning about regular people's lives. Uh, that's, I think, a good thing for Barnes to focus on. Uh, but it's far more effective when Ron Johnson decides to do it for him, pointing out that yeah, regular people are struggling and they do have it harder than people living in a lot of other countries. But he very much does not want to change anything about that, as you'll see in this clip. What would it take to get you to consider six to 12 weeks of paid time off for a mother to recover from childbirth or even a father and a mother to bond with their child? Well, again, I, I realize that benefits are really popular and spending money we don't have and mortgaging our kids' future is, is pretty popular. But the fact is we don't have the money for this. And if you force it on the private sector, you will start reducing jobs. You could put businesses out of work. Never forget, they want the government to be able to force you to have a child and then immediately get back to work and just leave the child on a counter or something for eight to 12 to 16 hours, that is their actual position. They don't care, they don't think it's worth spending literally any money, which we definitely have. Let's be clear about that. We're the richest country that has ever existed. And I will remind you, I know our audience doesn't need to be reminded. If we can jump ahead to graphic six, right now we're at zero weeks of paid leave. Even the six to 12 weeks that the moderator there brought up would still put us at the back of the pack. We bring up this chart and you'll see Estonia gives 86 weeks of paid leave. I understand that the text is small. We're the yellow one at the bottom. Ireland, Switzerland, New Zealand, Australia, they don't give a ton. But every one of these other countries cares enough. And you know what? They've found a way, they've, they've dug through the couch cushions and they've figured out a way to pay for it. Only the United States is uniquely ill-equipped to pay for people to be able to care for and bond with their child for you know a day or two following birth. Ben, what do you think? Well, I don't know how the richest nation on earth can be expected to compete with Bulgaria or Latvia or Slovakia's ability to pay for things. They don't even 
probably have stores with which to pay for stuff. So they've got all the money in the world to be able to pay for maternity leave. Those are countries that probably don't even have money to pay for better PR. So those com- countries have better public images. They're instead spending it on maternity leave and stuff that their people need instead of public relations. Here in America, we got great PR. And so how can you expect us to have any money left over to pay for the things we need? Have you looked at it from that perspective, John? I have not. You're opening up my mind right now. Uh, if you're watching the damage report from Bulgaria, we love you, <laughs> by the way. And we're very jealous of some of your social policies. Yeah, they anyway. probably are watching because they're home on maternity leave right now, taking <laughs> care of their children. <laughs> Which they should be. Yeah, strong anyway. point, John. So what? If you're going to make strong points, I'll walk off this show right now. Okay, I'm going to, I will stop now. If you're a fan of animals, you might want to appreciate them while we've still got them because they are going bye bye according to the World Wildlife Fund's most recent Living Planet report, which they say is their most comprehensive study of animal populations to date. They estimate that tens of thousands of monitored mammal, bird, amphibian, reptile, and fish populations have seen an average 69% decline in relative abundance over just a 50 year period. This is confirming basically some of their earlier reports that show that on average, wildlife population sizes are declining at a rate of about 2.5% every year. We'll get to some of the more specific ones. Now, it's important for you to understand that according to them, this does not literally mean exactly that there are 69% less of every animal in the world. Some populations have gone up, a lot have gone down. But overall, it does paint a pretty horrific picture of animal populations. And so they looked at 32,000 different species and they identified some areas, either areas of the animal kingdom or areas of the earth that are particularly hard hit. So they say that 83% of freshwater animal populations, that's the largest sort of like animal group, 83% decline. They blame pollution, species exploitation, overfishing, things like that. Regionally, Latin America, home to the Amazon rainforest, of course, has seen the largest average population abundance drop at 94%. And of course, they're looking at a number of different years. Most recently, that's getting far worse because Bolsonaro, of course, is like personally running through the Amazon with tanks of gasoline, setting the entire thing on fire. And so it's likely to get worse. In particular, the Pink River Dolphin in the Brazilian Amazon plummeted by 65% between 1994 and 2016. That is not to say that there are not animals that are doing better. There are conservation efforts and some of it has been successful. Populations of the Eastern Lowland Gorilla in the Democratic Republic of the Congos, their populations had fallen by 80% at one point. Now they have raised that population up to 600, still not a large population, but the efforts they're engaging in have been successful. But We have humanity moving into areas they haven't previously before. There's pollution, there's climate change, there's a lot of threats, and we are seeing the effects every single year around the globe. Ben, what do you think? Yeah, don't worry that 69% on average of vertebrates are declining. So what, first of all, keep in mind there's lots of invertebrates that are doing Great, a lot of jellyfish, a lot of amorphous shaped animals that are doing fine. So let's not stop climate change at all. We've got some mushy animals that are on the rise. (laughs) Don't worry about that. Plus we got 200 extra gorillas of one particular type of gorilla (laughs) in one type of area. Who cares that most animals on the planet are disappearing? In fact, the fact that it's just an average and we're still at a decline of 69% is so much more dire. It's so much scarier. That means that if it weren't for conservation efforts of us trying it all we can to stop the occasional tractor tearing down a rainforest, which is just insane to do in any respect, or the occasional effort to rehabilitate a species that is on decline, we'd probably be at 80 or 90% across the board of vertebrate species 
declining and disappearing. The fact yeah. that we're pushing back and it's still almost 70% decline is completely devastating. It's bonkers and obviously with very basic math unsustainable. That means in about 15, 20 more years, we're gonna be at like 99% decline over that period of time. And we have no more biodiversity on the planet and probably an insane danger to life on earth at that point because we rely on these species and the biodiversity of this planet to give us yeah. the resources that we need. And if that doesn't convince you, just the fact that there are pink dolphins that literally exist <laughs> in rivers on this earth. You can Google the Amazon pink river dolphin and we are reducing that population just from a we'd like to live in a place that's really cool and trippy standpoint. <laughs> you gotta stop this destruction of our wildlife habitat. 100%. Yeah, I, I had never seen the Pink River Dolphin. And admittedly, I've never met a Pink River Dolphin, but I'm already ready to say I would trade any 10 people for one Pink River Dolphin. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you're right. And, and Pink oh, sorry, River continue. Dolphin for, for, for Congress, so that's my exactly. Point. I'm donating the federal maximum. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, look, it's obviously bad as Ben was saying for biodiversity, but also think about like the, the loss to the next generation, like they're not gonna see these animals. They're not gonna know these animals, they're not gonna have a chance. Our kids someday might like look at a picture of a dolphin and not be able to identify it, let alone a dolphin fetus, Ben. They just won't be able to identify it <laughs> on site. Anyway, with that said, we're gonna take our second break of the hour and we come back, lots more news to get to, so don't go anywhere. Okay, everybody, we've got a little bit of time. Let's talk about a topic we have not spoken about in a little bit. A sheriff in Texas has now certified that the migrants that Ron DeSantis decided to pick up in Texas and fly to Martha's Vineyards are crime victims. And that is important for a number of reasons as we're gonna get into. So he certified the nearly 50 migrants that have been flown as victims of a crime. This is a key step in qualifying them for a special visa that they would not otherwise have been eligible for. And importantly, they want some or all of these migrants, whoever's willing to be witnesses in a criminal investigation. Thus, they need the visas, thus the certification. Uh, they go on to say these certifications will ensure that the migrants can continue to help our law enforcement officials and that they, there will be a process uh, and heal from the incredibly traumatic experiences they've suffered as a result of the cruel heartless acts committed against them. Many of the migrants, I will remind you, if you have not been following this story, uh, had come to the United States seeking asylum. They wanted a better life, they wanted to be safe, they, want, they wanted their families to be safe, they wanted to be able to work and contribute. And the idea that they were turned into political weapons by Ron DeSantis, who he and his team never saw a single one of them as a human being, never cared at all about where they were coming from, what life they wanted to lead, what they might be able to contribute to a community or to the United States at large, they never cared. And it's just so sickening. And thankfully, he himself is also being investigated. This is a different investigation, but he's under investigation on whether he misused taxpayer dollars to do these flights. The Treasury Department is looking into that. They're specifically looking on whether he used the interest on funds from the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds to do this. They're of course not supposed to use it for this sort of purpose. Anyway, Ben, what do you think? Yeah, I'm all in favor of any effort to investigate DeSantis and to punish him for any illegal use of funds. I've also said it from the beginning that I don't see the busing or flying of these migrants as horrendous and cruel as a lot of people see it as. I thought from the first minute that of all the horrible actions, this one actually most likely would protect those migrants. Like now they're getting extra protection for being a witness to this crime and there are 50 migrants that actually might be end, in the end treated better than the hundreds of thousands that are coming here without any heart. And I do wish that 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 the, the one part of while, while you certainly should never use people's political pawns and I do agree that DeSantis doesn't see them as human beings. Um, I don't think there is anything that wrong with asking other, it should be coordinated, but with asking other states to share in the burden of that and to and to be aware of what it takes to truly house and take care of 
these people that are coming here for a better life. If for no other reason, then it should expedite us finally making change to our immigration policies mm -hmm. that have not changed in over 30 years. If we truly care about it, we shouldn't just care about punishing DeSantis for making a spectacle of these 50 people. We should care about changing the system so that the millions who are coming here have a chance at actually, and who are already here, have a chance at gaining citizenship, at getting their asylum hearings to happen faster. And if this can shine a light on that, I don't think it's a net negative in the end. And maybe you get the bonus of DeSantis being punished for being <laughs> sloppy with the way in which he did it. Uh, I think that that is perfectly fair. I think that we should have a system like that. Of course, that's not what DeSantis is working towards, but but you're right. Maybe maybe some people can use this as a springboard towards making that sort of change, and maybe you can get some Republicans actually on board. God only knows what else would be attached to it. But anyway, with that said, we need to jump into our last topic. Let's uh, let's go to that as soon as we can. <clears throat> Throughout this week, John Fetterman has been in the target of a disgusting smear campaign of some people trying to obfuscate what his challenges following from his stroke actually are, implying that his need to occasionally use a voice to text program, they're like conflating it with not understanding language. Some of them go way further than that. Tucker Carlson is implying that he is now a transhumanist cyborg or something. Um, but that was earlier this week. And there's been a lot of strike back against that. So it would be weird to jump into that at this late date, but that's what Meghan McCain is choosing to do. She decided to tweet out, this is insane. How can someone be a senator without being able to speak or understand small talk? So he can speak perfectly fine as anyone would know if they'd watched even two seconds of the interview. So she looks like a clown for not understanding that. But more importantly, to say that you specifically need to be able to engage in small talk to be a politician is, that's ridiculous, but that's what she's doing. And of course, there's the added layer of the fact that as she will be quick to remind you, she's the adult daughter of uh, you know the now past John McCain, who had a brain glioblastoma while he was serving as a US Senator. Obviously suffered from disability as a result of that, as well as the torture he'd experienced earlier in his life. He literally died as a senator. So you would think that if anyone was gonna be like possessing of at least a little bit of empathy when it comes to someone who is recovering from a, an illness, that it might be her, but of course not. Ben, what do you think? Yeah, this again is Megan McCain missing the mark completely. Uh, I still do feel somewhat responsible for being partially uh, responsible for training her to host television. Uh, <gasps> back. And uh, that is part of what uh, probably helped her get the job at The View that raised her public profile. Um, she is a good person at heart and she is a lot more open minded, I think, than a lot of Republicans are these days. But she comes out with these bad takes all the time. It doesn't make sense. And this is not to be insulting to her father, but it's literally the same statement as her. If somebody said to her father, how can you be in the Senate if you can't go up high to give high fives to people after <laughs> votes? I mean, his arms only lift a certain amount. It just doesn't make sense. It has nothing to do with his ability to serve as a senator. Although I do think the Fetterman campaign should be doing a better job of explaining not just, "Oh, I will be better come January, but say we already have ex ex expressed permission that in Congress, everything will be will be captioned for me live. I'll be able to respond and see all of the pertinent hearings and and all of the pertinent meetings will be and committee hearings will be all transcribed. So there will be no issue. They're kind of leaving that a little bit as a gray area, which is an unnecessary window to leave that can be exploited by their opponents. I, so yeah, I, I get what you're saying in terms of the the, the perception. I would say uh, if I were you know the Senate, like if I was in charge of the Senate, I would be making clear that we have accommodations ready to go. Because what like not you may not have a lot of people who are immediately post stroke running for office, but what are we supposed to believe that if someone who is deaf got elected, just s out of luck, we can't do anything for you. I guess you can't. I mean that's crazy. Like people have disabilities, there need to be accommodations for that. There's literally federal laws requiring those accommodations. So I, I agree with you that, that they have to handle it as best as they can. But people telling things that they know are lies that have already been debunked, that just, that can't stand. 
Uh, anyway, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for our first hour. There's a lot more show to come, including the throwing away of the garbage people of the week. So don't go anywhere. Ben and I will be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.